Father, we come before your throne of grace again this evening. You have promised to give us the gift of the Holy Spirit. As we study, we certainly need his guidance, and we believe that you do as you've promised, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All righty, we're going to be continuing with uh, the two Adams. This is part two, and there may even be a third part. We'll see. Uh, but in this, this is core. This is core to the message that Jones and Wagner brought, and it's core to the Bible, and especially chapter 5 of Romans. And that's what we'll be looking at primarily tonight. I think what we'll do, well, we'll do a little bit of a review here. Um, we, we talked about the name Adam last time, and that his personal name is used about 11 times in the Old Testament, but it's used mostly in a corporate sense, either the entire human race or a segment of a population, but it's a corporate idea, and, uh, and that's over 500 times that it's used that way. We considered this one from the beginning. Adam was the head of the race, but he fell, and we find Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, where the battle was between Christ and Satan. Uh, the devil had thought, claimed that he was the prince of this world. Christ came as a human being, and he would have been a rightful heir to the entire earth, not only because he was a creator, but because he was a redeemer. And he had to be a human being, a divine human, not just a human being, but he came upon, uh, came unto the, the uh, see, scene as a human being, born as a human. And as the devil was tempting him, he said, make all these, you can make these, if you, if you are the son of God, make these stones into bread. I think I asked the question last time, was Christ hungry, do you think? Did he need some food? <laughs> Yeah, he could not have lasted much longer without food. And so it must have been a horrendous temptation to him, because it was a need. And yet, he would rather die than, uh, than create for himself. And so he answered, and he said, man shall not live by bread alone. And he was quoting from Deuteronomy 8.3. And in the word for man, where it says man shall not live by bread alone, is the word Adam. Adam shall not live by bread alone, but Adam shall live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So what Christ was saying in that temptation that the enemy was bringing to him, he's saying, I am the true Adam. I am the one who has uh, jurisdiction over earth. And that was a conflict at that time. And uh, so, well, it's still going on. But the devil is a defeated flow, foe. All the way through, every time he came in contact with Christ, he was defeated. And even Calvary, that looked like the devil had the upper hand, Christ was victorious in death because the devil couldn't keep him in the grave. <laughs> and we'll discuss that a little bit later. But um, in Romans chapter 5, the first five verses, and we won't get into this uh, tonight, but the first five verses deal with justification by faith in a practical sense. And uh, we'll look at that at another time. We're going we're to look at the two Adams um, later or during this time, but I wanted to look at these verses. This is known as the much more chapter, and there are several verses that use the term much more. Verse 9 says that um, much more then, having been justified by his blood, by the blood of Christ, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So then you have uh, verse 10, he continues with, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Then if we drop down to verse 15, it says, The free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man's offense many died, <laughs> the many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Then, if we drop down to verse 20, this is one probably that's, or no, 17 first. Um, he says, if by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. 
And then in verse uh, 20, this is the one that's probably known better than any other verse here. And he says, Moreover, the, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded, what? Much more. And that's, uh, that's one we quote quite a lot. But the whole chapter is dealing with, in the comparison and contrast, it's more of a contrast than a comparison between the two Adams. Whatever Adam did to the human race, Jesus Christ reversed, and much more uh, as far as our salvation is concerned. Now, in chapter, the same chapter, verses 6 through 11, and we'll take a look at that, this reveals how God revealed and applied to humanity his righteousness that was based on the death of Christ. And it starts in verse 6. When we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the godly, <laughs> for the ungodly. Then he says, verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved and say wrath from uh, through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So th these verses are dealing, showing what God has done for the whole human race. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to him. And 2 yeah, Corinthians 5 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And he's given us, in fact, let's, let's go there, because that's, that's a good, uh, it's a good uh, passage. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and uh, if I can get to it here. And beginning with, uh, we've already, well, we'll read it, read it again, verse 18. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's our message that God has given to us. We can go to anybody in the world, God, and tell them God was in Christ reconciling you to himself. Will you accept that reconciliation? It's as simple as that. And he goes on then to show the, the reason for it. Verse 21, for he made him, God the Father made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What an exchange that God has provided, not only provided, but did. And uh, so this, so chapter 5, coming back to chapter 5 of Romans, uh, what he did in and through Christ is to be received by faith alone. This is what we receive when we, we say by faith in Christ alone, we receive the reconciliation, the justification, everything that was worked out for us uh, as Christ as the second Adam. Uh, I want, oh, I've got something I read this morning, and I want to share it with also in comparing the, um, the love of God with the pagan idea. Um, the Greeks had, from their legends and their folklore and that type of thing, they, they had a story that said that, that, um, that illustrated the greatest love there is. And Paul may have been referring to that. It says when, when someone, when you die for a good man, uh, this is, uh, but God is much more in that he died for enemies. And this, but this is what it is. This, uh, um, for scarcely a righteous man will for one would die, yet at peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. And there was a well-known story in the days of Paul, 
And there were a couple of lovers, Admetus and Elsesius. Uh, he was a young man, and their gods said he must die. And he would be offered as a sacrifice, unless they could find someone who would take his place. So he went to his parents, and they said, oh, we love you, but we, we, we can't do that. And he went to friends who he'd helped. He was a good man. He helped many people. And he went to different ones and said, will you uh, give your life for me? And uh, they, oh, we can't do that. The reply was always the same. No, we just can't do it. Finally, his girlfriend said, well, he's a good man. I will die for him. And the Greeks said, this is it. This is the highest form of love. Be willing to die for a good man. And that's Paul, whether he had this in mind or not, but he said, how much more? God died for his enemies. And this would have been unheard of among the Greeks or any of the pagans. And so that's the contrast that we have here. So verse 12, and we'll look at that one also, Verse 12 through the rest of the chapter is dealing with the, or will deal with the contrast between the two Adams. Just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Now you notice in verse 13 there's a parenthesis. And that parenthesis goes all the way through chapter 17. So Paul is breaking off his argument. He he makes a statement, but he doesn't finish it. He doesn't finish it until he gets to verse 18. and We'll look at that in a little bit. Um, but he says that this is how it ended. Sin entered the world through the one man, Adam, and all have sinned. And uh, what remains then in the chapter is a pre uh, presentation of the parallelism between the two Adams, between the work of Christ, who is the second Adam, the last Adam, and uh, its results of justification and rec uh, reconciliation. And the work of the first Adam and its result is sin and death. That's all, uh, that's all uh, Adam contributed to us. Now this parallel exists between Adam and Jesus as the heads of groups of human beings. But the parallelism is more of a contrast instead of a comparison. The only comparison is that you have the two atoms, but everything else is uh, by contrast. And we'll, we'll go into detail a little bit later, but here, uh, just to go through this briefly, you have the two columns. You've got the one man, Adam, in the left-hand column. You've got Christ in the other column. Then you've got sin entered by one man. We've got the verses here. And then grace entered through Christ, the one man. One act of sin brought sin and death. One act of righteousness brought grace and salvation. A judgment on everyone because of one sin. But we have justification to all because of one gift, the gift of Christ and righteousness. Death reigned through one man. Many reign in life through one man. Many died because of the trespass of one man, verses 12 and 15. Grace overflowed by the gift of one man in verse 15. Then the many were made sinners by one man's disobedience. Verse 19, and then also the many, you know, many, many of the Bibles, most all Bibles, do not have the article or the, but it's in the original language, the many uh, were made righteous by one man's obedience. And we'll look at this a, a little more in detail later on. I want to share some things now from A.T. <coughs> Jones. The reason I do this, many people do not understand, do not read Jones and Wagoner. And so I want to present this or read this to show what he believed about the two Adams and about the plan of salvation. This is basic uh, to our salvation. And so he quoted uh, verse 12 that says, by one man sin and death entered the human race. And you find this, if you have the uh, General Conference Bulletin or if you have the CD-ROM, uh, you can you can read the whole thing. I would encourage you if you have opportunity to read the whole the whole uh, sermon. He did a, a series of ser sermons in two years, uh, 1893 and 1895, both the same title, 
but he very sel seldom repeated himself <laughs> on this. But anyhow, in this one, this is what he had to say. Now, leaving out the verses in parenthesis, that would be getting with verse 13 and ending in verse 17, uh, and reading them afterward, read the 18th verse. Therefore, as by the offense of one, that man that had sinned, and the, and the brackets are his, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, that man, again, in parenthesis, uh, that did not sin, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, and this would be Adam, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one, that man that did not sin shall many, or the many, be made righteous. Then we have this. He says, Adam was a figure of him that was to come. That one to come is Christ. Adam was the figure of him. Wherein was Adam the figure of him? In his righteousness? He said, no, for he did not keep it. He did not keep the law. He did not keep the word of God. Was Adam a type of Christ in sin? And again, the answer is no, for Christ did not sin. Wherein then was Adam the figure of Christ? It is in this, that all that were in the world were included in Adam. And all that are in the world are included in Christ. In other words, Adam in his sin reached all the world. Jesus, the second Adam, in his righteousness touches all humanity. That is where Adam is the figure of him. That was to come. So we read on. And then he quotes uh, Romans 5.15. And we'll look at it a little bit. But I wanted to share something with you. that There are three groups of us one time were meeting together. And they were trying to bring us together into harmony with, uh, well, I thought it would be the 1880 concepts, but it wasn't that. And I listened to one man, and if I mentioned his name, you would, you'd be familiar with it. I asked, or he, he started talking, and I thought, is he saying that Adam, what Adam did to the human, war, the human race was, was greater than what Christ did for the human race? It was not clear, but I thought that's what he was saying. So I asked him a question. I said, are you saying that this, Adam's work, his sin, reached into the human family much more deeply than the righteousness of Christ and what Christ did for the human race. He said, yes, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> now, if we believe that, is there a single human being that could be saved? Not at all. Not at all. If Christ's work was not greater than Satan's, there is no hope for us. Or I should say, uh, of Adam. Or even, well, the devil too. Uh, whatever happened uh, with Christ completely abolished what Adam did to us and what the devil has, has been doing to us. But let's take a look at verse 15 now. Uh, <clears throat> this is, uh, and again, Jones was quoting from this one. We've already read it, but we'll read it again. He says, but the free, well, let's, let's go back to verse 14 also. He says, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is the type of him to come. But the free gift is not like the offense, for if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. So here we've got the tremendous contrast between these two. And... Um, he says, these are the two men whom we're studying. That one man by whom sin entered, and that one man by whom righteousness entered. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if one man's offense Death reigned by one, that is, the first Adam. Much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ, the second Adam. The first Adam touched all of us. What he did included all of us. What he did made us what we are. Now, here is another Adam. 
And this is the question. Did he touch as many as the first Adam did? That is the question. That is what we are studying now. Does the second Adam touch as many as did the first Adam? And the answer is that it is certainly true that what the second Adam did embraces all that were embraced in the first, what the first Adam did. What he should have done, what he could have done, would embrace all. The first Adam's righteousness would have meant all to us, and the second Adam's righteousness means all to as many as believe. And then he puts in this sentence. That is correct in a certain sense, but not in the sense in which we are studying it now. We are now studying it from the side of the Adams. The question is, does the second Adam's righteousness embrace as many as does the first Adam's sin? Look closely. Without our consent at all, without our having anything to do with it, we were all included in the first Adam. We were there. All the human race were in the first Adam. What that first Adam, that first man, did meant us. It involved us. That which the first Adam did brought us into sin. And the end of sin is death. And that touches every one of us and involves every one of us. Well, says one, we are involved in other sins besides that one. And then Jones countered, not without our choice. When God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, he set every man free to choose which master he would serve. And since that, every man that has sinned in this world has done so because he chose to do so. So he makes a difference between consent and non-consent. And uh, what Adam did to us was without our consent. Let me ask the question, did Jesus do something for us without our consent? Yeah. In fact, most of the world has not contented, consented. But Christ still did it for them. He still waits for them to receive it by faith. But he exhausted the penalty, which is the equivalent of the second death, for every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. Now, uh, I just, uh, this goes back to verse 14. The reign of death. The reign of death went from Adam to Moses. That's what it says in verse 14. Death reigned. No one come back from the dead. From the time that Adam sinned and died until Moses. Moses was the first man who was ever resurrected. Was there a conflict between God and Satan over the body of Moses. Huh? Jude chapter 9, oh, there's only one, Jude chapter 1, there's only one chapter, verse 9, it says, Michael um, contended with the body of Moses, the devil was, was contending for it, and Michael said, the Lord rebuke you, and he called Moses out of the grave. Why did the devil try so hard to keep him in the grave? The grave is the devil's prison house. And he had seen that nobody came back from the grave. And so when God was ready to, rose, to raise Moses from the earth, from the grave, he fought with every particle that he could use to keep him from doing it. But he could not prevent it. God says, step aside, Moses, come forth. What do you think the angels of all the unfallen worlds that they saw? They had never seen anything like this either. But they were watching intently of what was going on. Now, there was another one, uh, and uh, let's take a look at that in, in Revelation chapter 1 and uh, verse 18, where uh, <clears throat> this is the, uh, uh, John was on the Isle of Patmos, of course. Let's see, where are we at here? I'm in the wrong book here again. Um, Revelation and chapter 1. And John was completely overwhelmed with the glory of Christ. And in verse uh, 17, the middle of it, well, verse, first part, he said, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. 
But he laid his hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Now, did the devil try to keep Christ in the grave? How did he do it? Well, the Roman soldiers, I mean, they, they locked the tomb. Then they put a company of soldiers around that so that nobody could get in. Then evidently the devil's angels were surrounding them so that nobody could get by them. It only took one angel from heaven to scatter the whole lot. And what we see here is that a dead Christ is mightier than a living devil. Because the devil could not keep him in the grave. And so how much more a living Christ. And it's the living Christ that gives us his righteousness, his very life, to defeat the devil. And he will do it in our, own, in our flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit. Is that good news or bad? <laughs> by the power of his word. As that word becomes a part of us, as we submit to God, uh, we will be uh, more than conquerors through him who has died for us and rose again. All right, now we're going to come back again to verses 12 and, and look at verse 18. In verse 12, that we began with, Therefore, just as through one man, this is Adam, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. And then you have the parenthesis, 13 through 17, and then he finishes his argument from verse 12. He repeats it, not in the same words, but the same idea. Verse, first part of verse 18 Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. So the same idea in the first part of uh, verse 18 is identical with, with uh, verse 12. You see that? Very clear, isn't it? Now, notice what the punchline is. The conclusion and the main point is part B of verse 18. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. So he's drawing a, con a contrast. What Adam did to us, and, and in verse 12, and then you have the parenthesis, and then he comes back to the same point. Uh, we're brought into condemnation because of Adam's sin, but much more, even so, through Christ's righteousness, the free gift that came to all men results in justification of life. The uh, New English Bible has it this way. So the issue of one just act is acquittal and life for all men. That's pretty clear. <laughs> but that's the idea that we have in that verse. Now, I want to come back. We're, this is, we looked, we're, we've already gone through this briefly. We're going to go through now step by step uh, from comparing the two, the two Adams. Here we have uh, the one man, Adam, in verse 15. One man's trans trespass, the many died. And then you have the one man, Christ. One man's grace produced righteousness to the many. The same many that was taken down by Adam, that same many was <clears throat> given God's grace. Then we have, in verse 16, one man, which is Adam, from him came judgment and condemnation. And then we have the one man Christ, many trespasses. There's, this is so out of proportion. We're going to look at the pro proportion a little bit later. But it's many trans, uh, transgressors, transgressors uh, produce the gift of justification. And uh, uh, it's, it's absolutely tremendous, I think. Verse 17, through one man's trespass, death reigned. We looked at that. And through one man, Jesus Christ, believers will reign in life. And I believe this would extend into eternal life. Verse 18, one trespass produced condemnation for all men. And in the same verse, one act of righteousness, of justification of life, comes to all men. And the women are included. Okay? We're talking about men and women. We're talking about the man Adam, which means... Uh, in fact, Adam and Eve both were called Adam uh, because they were human beings. 
uh, in Gen Genesis uh, 1 and chapter 2. Uh, the one man, Adam, because of his disobedience by this one man, many, the many, or all, are constituted sinners. Is there any, anyone in the world that's not a sinner? What about, what about believers? Are we sinners as believers? Okay, what's the difference between a believer and a non-believer? We are believing sinners. <laughs> we believe in, believe in Christ, and, but we still we have a fallen nature, and we fall from time to time. And we're not supposed to, but we do. And not as an excuse, but we are, we are sinners, but we're under the grace of God. The non-believer, he's under the grace of God, but he has no salvation. And that's a, that's a big difference. What does salvation mean? Pardon me? What does salvation mean? What does salvation mean? Okay, it means, uh, it comes from the word to save. Um, we use it as, uh, we can be saved, say, from an accident, from happening. But if we are in an accident and we're in a wreck or something of a car, when they pull us out, we're saved from the wreck itself. And so when Christ is our Savior, he has, we've, we've all wrecked <laughs> uh, because of sin. But Calvary reconciled us, so he reached into our wreck and pulled us out because he was lifted up on Calvary to exhaust the penalty that was against us. And that's salvation. He saves us by his grace from sin to righteousness. And that salvation is... Redemption is another word. These, these words have... Um, they are synonyms, or they're, they're, they're not exactly identical. But each one, salvation talks about being saved from something. The word redemption has the same idea, but it means to be bought back from something. And, and usually it's used with, uh, in slavery. If a man or a woman was in slavery and someone would come along and buy that person, they would take them out of slavery and some would set them free. And the whole, uh, the Roman economy was all based on slavery. And, uh, and so that's where you get some of the redemption ideas. But there are other ones. Atonement is another one. Atonement means at one, at one meant with God. And so they all talk about the same thing, but they look at it from different angles. So, okay, clear as mud? Okay. okay. Yeah. When we said that, I didn't understand yeah. what it was, so that's why I'm glad you asked. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. So we go then to one man, Adam, sin and sin rate. Yes? Uh, just a quick question. When you said that um, the unbeliever is a sinner just like a believer is who's a sinner, but the unbeliever is a sinner who's not under the grace of God. Oh. Well, he'd be under the grace as far as uh, living. The whole root world is encircled by God's grace. But it's not saving grace. It's, uh, well, it's saving grace from the standpoint that they don't, don't die. But the time will come if they, re if they reject it, there's no way of salvation. But uh, uh, we'll look at that a, 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 another time perhaps where the entire world is uh, bathed in God's grace. That, as soon as Adam sinned, in fact, let's, let's look at something here. In, uh, I think it's in 1 Timothy. This is before, uh, before sin ever entered the, uh, the uh, world. It may have been in the universe at this time. Um, let's see, I'm Titus. I think it's uh, Titus and 2 Timothy in verse 9. It says, uh, speaking about God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus, when? Before time began. So as soon as Adam and Eve sinned, grace was waiting to take them by the hand and pull them out of eternal death. In fact, you, uh, sometimes you... Uh, as a Seventh-day Adventist, you may be accused of uh, being under the, the old Jewish law. And not well, because of Calvary, we're now under grace. And you can tell them this, 
that you believe in at least four times as much grace as they do. Because they believe that grace started at Calvary. We believe that grace was before Adam's sin, but at least 4,000 years before Calvary, grace was there. And we have it in chapter 6 of Genesis where it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So grace was all the way through. And it was only by grace that anybody could be saved, either Old Testament or New Testament. So we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And that was the same in the Old Testament as the New. No change whatsoever on that. Now, let's, let's go on. Um, we have, uh, sin, sin reigned in death by Adam. And because of Christ, grace reigns to eternal life. Then let's read uh, Romans chapter 5 again, 15 and 16. Here is a tremendous, um, tremendous concept. Verses 15, we've read this before. The free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, or the many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to the many. And then verse 16. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. Do you see how out of proportion this is? <laughs> and we're going to look at it. Uh, I... Uh, we had a mathematician in our uh, earlier cl class. Uh, the, um, do you remember in, in high school, maybe college, uh, you used to study ra uh, ratios and proportions, in arithmetic. And this guy was in calculus, so he was getting the answer right, right away. Uh, but, and I understand that the kids in grade school now are, are dealing with these concepts. But this is, uh, uh, this is what we're going to look at now. Verse 15, one sin... Because of one sin, many, or all, the many, died. But the one gift abounded to the many. Do you see the difference between this? One sin caused the death of everyone. One gift of life abounded to the same group. So here we have sin brought condemnation. In verse 16, but the one gift came from many offenses and resulted in justification <laughs> because of Jesus. Now, here is the, this is a formula for ratios and proportions. Is this in proportion and how do we figure it out? Well, what we do, we cross multiply. Two times eight is what? What's four times four? Okay, is that in proportion? Yes. So here we have, this is in proportion. Let's try this one. 1 is to 80 as 80 is to 6,400. Is, now, why do you say that? You guys are pretty fast. The guy that was here uh, said the same, but he was doing it from calculus. <laughs> and he mentioned that. But how do you know it's in proportion? All right. 80 times 80 is 6,400. So... That's in proportion. Now, what about this one? Is this in proportion? 1 is to 80 as 80 is to E. Well, you'd have to figure out what E is. Oh, really? What is E? Eternity. Is this in proportion? It is so far out of proportion that it can't even be measured. And this is the difference between Adam's one sin and Christ's one act of righteousness. Adam's one sin caused a whole world to fall, to be condemned. Christ's one act of righteousness caused the entire world to be acquitted. It's, it's just it's out of proportion. We can't even wrap our minds around it. We, we're studying this throughout eternity. So, the E is eternity. So it is with the one gift of God that's compared to sin. God's gift is so out of proportion 
to sin, it cannot be measured. Now, had you or I been the only one that sinned? No, I said, if, if we had been the only one, would God have done this for us? Yes. Absolutely. That's how much he thinks of us. But he gives us these tremendous, expansive ideas so that, so that we won't get lost, but we'll understand that uh, he is totally for us. In fact, let's go to Romans 8. That, it's another, it's a tremendous chapter. And uh, the enemy is always banging, banging at our doors, trying to get us to be separated from Christ or from God. And then in verse 31, he asks the question, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And then verse 33, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. 34, who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore, is also risen, and is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Tremendous passage. And that, the word there in verse um, 33, it says, who shall bring a charge against God's elect? That word is a charge, a legal charge in a court. And God has re reversed that. He is a judge, and he stands for those who believe. Doesn't he? Absolutely. So, coming back to the proportion, ratio and proportion. One sin is to condem condemnation to all mankind. As many sins are to the one gift of justification. God has just overwhelmed the forces of evil by the one act of Calvary. It stands, it will stand throughout eternity. The one act of Christ will completely abolish all sin. Completely did this to the devil, and he will do it in the last days, and he will do it throughout eternity. It will be because of the cross that angels will be kept from singing, uh, sinning. Power of grace. Romans 5.15. Uh, 5, this is from the New English Bible also. God's act of grace is out of all proportion to Adam's wrongdoing. For if the wrongdoing of that one man brought death upon so many, its effect is vastly exceeded by the grace of God of that one man and the gift that came to so many by the grace of the one Man, Jesus Christ. Do we have the advantage? We do. We do. A believer is put on a tremendous point of, of advantage. And with that, I think we better close. But we cogitate on this, and uh, we will continue next time on. Uh, Maybe again on the on the on the two atoms, but we'll see what what we can do. But let's let's pray. Or any any questions or observations? If not, we'll we'll pray. Father, thank you again for so much for your goodness to us. And you've promised that it is your goodness that leads us to repentance, and your goodness is revealed in Calvary as no other place. That. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. Yes. And we were reconciled to you through that one act. Thank you so much for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.